Hello and welcome to episode number 245 of the Armin Show podcast, where great things are happening. It's 2020. Here we are with Dr. Sarah Rose Cavanaugh, who wrote Hive Mind, the book I've been reading recently, talked about the new science of tribalism in our divided world. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. Glad to. Now, you're a psychologist by trade. You're at Assumption College. How did you get into psychology in the first place? What led you there? We want to know. Great. I have always loved psychology. I actually wanted to be a psychologist from, I think, about third grade. (laughs) I used to watch TV shows, and um, as I got older, you know, kind of inappropriate TV shows and movies, and there was always the psychologist trying to puzzle everything out, whether they were working with police or uh, whether they were in therapy, and I was just always engaged by those ideas and uh, really interested and took a pretty straight path. I think took AP psych in high school, psychology as my undergraduate major, uh, and then into my PhD program and beyond. Mm -hmm. This is cool. You did your PhD at Tufts University. What was your research most on and how did you get into specifically emotions and emotion regulation? I worked with Dr. Lisa Shin, and her research was focused on the neuroscience of post-traumatic stress disorder. And so she did a lot of research studying people who had been through a trauma, uh, some who had then developed post-traumatic symptomatology, and some who were well, continuing after the trauma. And she wanted to understand what was going on at the level of the brain that could help us understand what put some people at risk and some people not. And so we would have people do measures of attention and emotion while they were in the fMRI scanner and compare their brain function. I loved that research, but I was really focused on teaching. I loved teaching and taught nine courses uh, before I graduated from uh, my doctoral program. And I didn't see an easy path to doing neuroimaging at a small liberal arts college where I could do a lot of teaching. And so I started in my postdoctoral research to focus more on healthy emotion regulation, where I could study um, people's behavior and people's experiences rather than their brain function. That's cool. Now, one thing that comes to mind first when I was seeing that emotion regulation, when you see society, I want to always start go broad. When you look at society, what how healthy is our society emotionally? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a big question. I, when you talk to people, you know, I don't have data on changing emotions over time, but certainly in talking to friends and colleagues and students, it does seem like we're in a, kind of an emotional soup <laughs> right now and emotions are running high and more negative emotions than positive emotions. And in the book, I argue that maybe one thing that could help us is uh, better emotion regulation, better focus on reframing, uh, having less fear, less moral outrage, and more productive emotions. Mm -hmm. I like that you represent, the book is called Hive Mind. Bees are in a hive, but it's only honeybees that are the ones that work in a way that we do. Other bees are more they battle each other in some form. They're not really as friendly, mm. but we're like a collective consciousness. Is that what the hive mind represents? Yes, I think the metaphor of the hive mind works on a couple different levels. One, as you're suggesting, that we sometimes can synchronize with each other, that we can behave in ways that um, bear some similarity to other social animals, especially the social insects. And I think you can see this um, across a lot of different human experiences and behaviors. It also, I think, operates on the level of you know, we decide together sort of collectively as a society and as smaller in-groups within a society, what is important, what is true even. And so we think collectively as well. And we follow social norms about how you're supposed to behave. And a lot of this, we just absorb from the culture. And I think that that's when you see hive mind referenced, you know, on Twitter and social media, you know, people will directly query the hive mind. They'll say, hey, hive mind, (laughs) 
Um, what do you know about this fact or that fact? And we don't operate in isolation. Um, and so I think that it can operate on multiple levels. It made me think of how on the internet, it really proved this point that very quickly, like words are being made more quickly now than ever before or social phenomenon or a new dance or whatever is very quickly becoming, you don't know that? We just created mm -hmm. it. Now you should know <laughs> that some percentage. And then I like that you said that in the book, like if once 25% of a group picks up on something, it's thought to be a normal thing and then people join in. That's the tipping yes, point. Yes, it seems to be, yeah, uh, a certain tipping point. Ed Young wrote a wonderful article for The Atlantic on that tipping point based on research on that matter. And you can see it happen uh, and how, you know, something that was unacceptable suddenly becomes acceptable. Uh, like Ed uses the example of the legalization of marijuana, um, that it just seemed to cascade. <laughs> um, it was, you know, it seemed like far-fetched that we would get there. And then all of a sudden, um, all the, like dominoes, all of these states started legalizing it. Would you say that this relates to the fact like writing is very, there's a lot of value in writing and then telling a story. If you create a story from scratch and then repeat it and there's narrative and you keep passing it on to people, you've created a scenario that now after a while it passes on to enough people, you basically made a thing, you made a reality that was not there before. Right, I think stories are tremendously powerful and a lot of why they're so powerful is because they're so transmissible from one across the hive mind, from one human being to another. And so I absolutely agree with that. You talk about neural synchrony in the book and people synchronizing with one another. Uh, are there any examples of that that you have seen in research or that you have done where people are connecting in some form almost telepathically? <laughs> uh, I don't know about telepathically, but it does it does feel eerie sometimes, uh, the extent to which one person has an idea and then someone else has the same exact idea. Um, my favorite research in this area is by Talia Wheatley, and she's at Dartmouth. She does really interesting studies of uh, MBA students who start a program together, and they're up in New Hampshire, and they're kind of in a small community, and they travel together as a cohort over several years, and she's taken to, to studying the, them forming social networks in real time and looks at their brain function. And she and her colleagues have some really fascinating studies showing that you can statistically predict who's friends with who's, whom um, based on how their brain reacts to YouTube little clips and that you can even statistically predict who is friends of friends um, because their brain activity in response to these clips is less similar than the friends, but it's kind of one step above, um, one step apart. And so that's some of my favorite research on neural synchrony. But you can see synchronization happen. Um, it happens a lot with music. Uh, so it happens in chorus and when people are singing together, uh, people rowing together, laughing together. And we tend to mirror each other, uh, our facial expressions, our postures, our um, all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. I noticed this most heavily in recent social media app, TikTok, where people do a dance, then 500,000, <laughs> 5,000 people do the exact same dance to the same music. Right. And it's almost like not doing something different is better in that form. Sometimes a little bit, but for the most part, it's like being part of a bigger collective. Mm-hmm. You mentioned yeah, that yeah, in the book, I talk about that. Uh, it's a little older example about the ice bucket challenge and mm -hmm. how strange that was that just everybody started dumping buckets of ice on their head. <laughs> it looks funny, actually, after the fact. At the time, it's like, this makes complete sense. But then yeah. like a few years <laughs> later, everybody was just pouring. Yeah, it's true. It's like if you thought of something else today, running into a wall, and then you just got a bunch of people to keep running to a wall. That was the, that's my, it's copyrighted. That idea is copyrighted. <laughs> <laughs> it's classic. Now, you started to talk about the online framework, the internet, and how that can either build us up or tear mm -hmm. us down in some forms is very impactful because a lot of people are now almost living on it pretty much in total. Uh, can you speak about how it can build up relationships or can also leave people not feeling well? Yes, sure. I think that it's easier to talk about the taking us down, uh, and that certainly is what gets the most attention, so we can start there. Mm -hmm. But, and I think, you know, I won't belabor this point because so, so much conversation has already been dedicated to it. Um, you know, there's online harassment, uh, cyberbullying, um, 
the most alarming thing I think that the internet has allowed to happen is for conspiracy theories to flourish and for fringe groups to find each other and uh, engage in what Michael Barkin calls fusion paranoia, where these conspiracy theories that used to stay pretty separate um, have begun to fuse together, and that's pretty alarming. <laughs> um, you know, there's lots of ways that we can, the internet and social media can get in the way of well-being. I think that there's also ways that it can build us up. Uh, I interview some people in the book who've had those experiences, who have connected with uh, in-groups when they were isolated, who have uh, reconnected with their ethnic heritage, who have uh, found social support for um, depression online. And so there's lots of those ways that I think that um, if we use social media in a way to connect with each other uh, and in a way to enhance our social functioning that it can be a net positive. I think that at the end of the day, you know, if you weigh, if you put them on a scale, uh, I do think that the negatives may outweigh the positives uh, many times. But I think that spending so much time talking about all of the negatives Believes the fact that it's not going away. <laughs> I don't think uh, we're going to cancel the internet, right? So why not talk about ways that we can more shore up the positives uh, mm -hmm. and and do the be our best to um, help with the negatives? Uh, and I think that when we're addressing the negatives more than individual actions, I think we can all try to be nicer in social media. I think that's great. But really, we're going to need the help of the platforms themselves, that they're not regulating, especially when it comes to things like conspiracy theories, that what needs to happen is, you know, Facebook and YouTube and all the rest, they need to be addressing these issues from a much larger perspective than uh, one by one actions can do. Mm -hmm. Does it relate at all that, like when, if something really bad happens in your life, the fear of that it was always bigger psychologically because that would like end your life versus like finding berries in the wild. There's a positive, but you might find them tomorrow. It's not as big of a deal. Is that why the negative is way more weighted than the positive? Yeah, I, that's an interesting perspective. I think that for sure, you know, the, that's true of negative versus positive emotions in general, right? Our negative emotions probably evolved, as you're saying, to get us away from danger or contaminants or um, things that could be life-threatening, uh, whereas the positive emotions cause us to seek out social connection and uh, new opportunities and creativity, uh, which is all wonderful, but is probably going to <laughs> um, drive a lot less of behavior. It's going to be, um, as you're saying, less impactful. And so we probably are wired to pay a little more attention to threats than we are to uh, possibilities. And so we're going to have to, again, use motion regulation to reframe and refocus our attention uh, to kind of fight against that, especially fear, because I think fear just freezes us up and uh, leads to inaction or flight where a lot of these problems we need to come forward and we need to be creative and playful to come up with some solutions. And so I think we need to regulate our fear and try to focus on solutions. Mm -hmm. The concept you just bring about, uh, brought up about fear, it reminds me, I just talked with somebody a couple of days ago about, he's writing a book about death and you're working on it for some years and very focused on people's distancing from death and their fear of it and how photo photographs are all like a death of the moment to the past. Mm. Uh, would you say that a lot of individuals are walking around with this fight, fight or flight response that you described later on with the amygdala all day long and then they're avoiding potential future and that they just keep pushing towards the future? Sure. Robert Sapolsky is one of my favorite science writers. Did. <laughs> oh, you did. Oh, I'm so jealous. <laughs> It was when I was in text interview time, so it's not an audio uh, video episode. Oh, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he, he's, he's just wonderful. And that's essentially, so as you know, uh, his one of his major theses is that uh, we evolved this fight or flight um, response to get us away from immediate threat, immediate danger, but that in contemporary society that we're just running this constantly and that that has consequences for our physical well-being, but also our psychological well-being. That makes sense. Yeah. It's almost like, uh, no, don't, don't push me. I'm already at my limit here. This is, yeah. I'm already at my thing. 
and there, there's very few like fully peaceful kind of fulfilled people walking around. They're just like, I could take more. I mean, <laughs> I'm in good shape. <laughs> One thing you had mentioned about the emotions as connected with faces, uh, you have done research on that. How are they connected? What can we know about what faces represent connected to our emotions? Mm -hmm. Facial expressions of emotion are really interesting. And so I think what you're referring to is probably a, um, a collaborative study that I did looking at cross-cultural differences in facial expressions. And recently I've been reading Lisa Feldman Barrett's book on uh, how, how emotions are said. made. Uh -huh. Yep. <laughs> um, and, you know, she's been talking at a lot of different conferences and i think that our faces do express a lot uh, they express a lot about emotions uh, they're a little more complex than uh, some of the older research showing that they're static images and in the in the article that i published with uh, my colleagues we had um, gradations of facial expressions right so not just pure not the kind of cartoonish um, full expression where someone's posing something but um, more ambiguous to see what the different ambiguities were with people's um, detection of emotion and so i think that we do we do communicate using our faces uh, quite a lot we communicate our emotions um, but the the story is a lot is getting a lot muddier I think as we gather more and more data about uh, how good we are or aren't at reading each other's emotions using our faces mm -hmm. that makes me think of also uh, how applicable is it that you can tell what someone's personality might be like based on their facial structure almost even before they make any facial movements and then after a few facial movements is it is it likely they will have some sort of artificial intelligence thing or face reading technology that will have a rough idea because i've noticed like certainly longer faces have a certain or downturned eyes or certain features connect with certain people is that fair to say um i don't know of any data on that particularly and I think first impressions are really interesting. They can tell us a lot, but then also with first impressions are a lot of our um, biases and assumptions about people based on gender and race and things like that. So I'd be a little wary of using that uh, as, a, as a method of judging what a person's going to be like. That's a good point, right? It doesn't really give them as much room if you already have this mm -hmm. idea beforehand. That's true. In one section of the book, called hacked which is great so you talk <laughs> about the people who are vulnerable among all of us who is the group or who are the groups that are the most vulnerable among us and why is that that they are vulnerable mm -hmm. right so in that chapter i you know i try to pay respect to the fact that you know that a lot of people feel that social media hasn't been uh, a net positive in their lives and try to take the lens of you know who may be more resilient and who may be more vulnerable and the data so far against early days but the data so far seem to indicate that people who are already really um have a tendency to do a lot of social comparison to kind of compare themselves to others uh, people who are more focused on appearance, uh, people who are more likely to be susceptible to fear of missing out, to feel left out uh, or abandoned for other personality reasons, uh, that these personality traits may cluster together and make some people more vulnerable uh, to the ill effects of social media than others. I, think in terms of things like conspiracy theories, people who are so socially isolated, uh, who also feel like they've been given a short shrift at life, those um, people may be, may have this attraction toward these systems of meaning that um, kind of confirm their worldview. And so I think we need to take a look at these sorts of vulnerabilities and perhaps have special interventions uh, for people and then, but then there are groups that we you might think would be more vulnerable, such as uh, people who experience major depressive disorder or other anxiety uh, problems, that these people may actually benefit more from social media than uh, some people because it's sometimes be easier to reach out for social support and to be socially engaged online than it is to do it face to face. And if people are isolated to their homes because of, um, again, depression or uh, illness or something like that, social media can open this whole window to social interaction. 
And so I think that overall the research, we need a lot more research and it needs to get more contextual and focus a little bit more on individual differences and who might be more vulnerable versus less vulnerable. Mm -hmm. If there was a person who was vulnerable, would you lean more towards like Cal Newport and his book, Digital Minimalism, like avoiding social media in total or uh, finding out what the issues are about themselves in the first place? Which one would be their first step? Right. I think the first step would be addressing the underlying issue. Um, so for instance, you know, a lot of attention has been paid to the concept of addiction as applied to social media and smartphones and gaming. And from the people that I talked to in the research that I did, most um, people that, or at least the people I found most compelling, seem to really believe that you know that you can have really problematic use patterns with any of these technologies, but that usually it's an underlying problem with anxiety or depression or social isolation, and that it would be a lot more effective to uh, address those than to just. Um, to address the actual technology. Um, that said, you know, if people, it may be that there are certain people who find it uh, is easier to cut it out completely than to try to just minimize it. Um, and because I think usually the healthiest approach uh, is moderation, but for some people, a little bit may not be good. Um, so I'm certainly not against addressing issues one by one. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. There's, there's quite a few books on like avoiding social media that have come out this year and last year. Yeah. <laughs> it's a theme. Now, at the end of the book, you have B lessons, which are lessons for bees, which are us in the collective and the ways to respond to these issues. One of them I like definitely is uh, building and supporting architectures of serendipity. I like serendipity mm -hmm. and the variety of life, maybe entropy, if you will. Can you mm -hmm. speak on that topic? Right. Uh, and so um, Cass Sunstein is an author of numerous books on conformity. And uh, I read his book, Hashtag Networked. <laughs> and um, that was his term, uh, the architectures of serendipity. And he argues, which I found, again, very interesting, that part of the problem with social media <clears throat> is that <clears throat> Sorry, it allows us to form you know this concept of echo chambers. It allows us to use the algorithms and in ways that um, increasingly only expose us to ideas that we already agree with, and that we need to intentionally uh, manufacture opportunities either societally or online that expose us to other people who we might not agree with, uh, expose us to different ideas, different ways of living, uh, different backgrounds, and that we can't just keep streamlining everything uh, into what he calls the daily me, <laughs> um, where you only see news and stories and ideas that you uh, find appealing. Right. Yeah, it turns into like a repeated it looks a little weird after a while if Google's like, this is exactly what you like. And then more yes. of exactly what you like. There's no, you start to turn into like whatever that Thursday was that you started browsing the internet. That Thursday mm -hmm. is repeated. <laughs> <laughs> you like this. That's kind of cool. Among some of the scientists you have read from or worked with, who are some individuals you have liked and what did you like about what they do? Mm -hmm. Or any that stand out? Right. I think... Let's see. Jim Cohn uh, is someone I liked before I wrote the book. <laughs> uh, he's a friend of a friend and now sort of a friend. And he is a social neuroscientist. But he, his research has always been some of my favorite research uh, in psychology and in neuroscience. And I had the benefit of interviewing him for the book. And his whole focus of his research is on... Um, why we hold hands and he had this one early experience doing therapy with a veteran and his wife um, and the wife held his hand through the therapy and that just helped him through the therapy and so he, and then he turned that on his on its head and started asking you know why do we do this and his whole research program evaluates how when our social others are present our body and our brain calms down even when we're under threat and use this to develop a social baseline theory, which argues that the basic unit of humanity is not the individual, but the social, uh, which is a very hive-mindy um, type of idea. 
and that when we separate people from each other, that is in itself a threat, in itself a cause for alarm. And so his, his research was uh, some of the most interesting psychology research. And then I also interviewed Kelly Baker, uh, who is a historian, and her academic work focused on um, the KKK in the 1920s. Um, and she has a lot of really innovative ideas uh, about how we address these in-group and out-group hostilities, uh, how journalism needs to change and how they report racism. Uh, and on, you know, she was the one who turned me on to some of the conspiracy theory work that I read and how the internet has changed and worsened those conspiracy theories and hate groups. And so she was also one of my favorite interviewees. Mm -hmm. The conspiracy theory concept is similar to a stories, but then taken into a category that's not maybe inspirational or like towards something of uh, social progress in a way. Right. And I think the other thing that conspiracy theories do, uh, I think they're compelling because they're stories. I think they're also compelling because they are systems of shared meaning. And so in that way, they almost have something more in common with religion. I think that they give people this, um, oh, everything's connected and it makes sense. And, you know, there's order to the universe. And I think that's part of their draw as well. Mm -hmm. I noticed that when I was reading the chapter about the vulnerable populations, if you have certain smooth ways of communicating and then you create a storyline and then you mm -hmm. tell them their issues are not actually issues, but actually <laughs> you just need to work in this system I've set up. They're like, oh, automatically just boom, transitioned over to your crew. And now you have a bunch of followers that you didn't help. Mm -hmm. You didn't actually help them in the process. They just, you got a quick join. I guess that's what kind of social media does in some ways too. It's like, let's look for individuals that maybe are more, uh, there's a hole to fill and then, keep them on the app a lot mm -hmm. right. which is funny you mentioned calmness in the first person you mentioned is it would you say if someone uh some people are very into asmr or other uh activities behaviors that keep them in a comfortable state maybe they live life in a comfortable state is that a problem for them when it leaves them more vulnerable to reality in the long term or is that just okay because it matches their personality so you mean um, if you're finding like fulfillment and calm and practices like that or meditation? Meditation, uh, not as much as meditation. I, I kind of think of meditation more uh, growth way, right? Mm -hmm. But like things that just, uh, it seems like help you pass the time uh, in like a relaxed kind of stupor, but you're not. Mm -hmm. Like if you actually put that person back into day-to-day -day activity, maybe it's more of a struggle. I don't know. Right. I thought about this. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, that's interesting. I think, um, I guess I would agree. Right. So if we're not engaging, if we're not joining the real world, which has a lot of negative emotions, it has a lot of challenges. Mm -hmm. I would, I would, I can see that, <laughs> but it would, that, that would be more of a struggle. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. If you had a message to all people of the planet, that would oh, represent. Boy. <laughs> Again? <laughs> I said, oh boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is the 7.8 billion people. I need this yeah. megaphone. I keep talking about it, but I just need to. <laughs> and then I could, here's the megaphone. Uh, but what would you tell them about uh, what you would want them to know of what you have learned? Mm -hmm. I think probably that. Let me think for a second. Mm -hmm. Probably, you know, one of the themes of the book has to do with the individual versus the collective. Uh, I might, and I try to make the argument that we need this precise balance between the two. Um, my, I've talked to my aunt, um, and who's an artist, and she's a very individualistic person, and she told me that my ideas in the book are dangerous <laughs> because the... Um, because when you engage in collective thinking, uh, that leads to conformity, it leads to um, in-group, out-group hostility, it leads to all of these ways in which you know, we become like the Borg. <laughs> and we have in our science fiction, all of these examples like the Borg of um, our fears of if we are to join with the collective that will lose ourselves. And I think that there certainly are dangers uh, and they spend a good part of the book reviewing them um, and we've talked a lot about that today. Um, there are dangers of collective thinking and um, 
behaving as a collective. But I think that there are also a lot of dangers in engaging as pure individuals and focusing purely on our individual happiness and ambition and perfecting the self and hacking the self. And that in some ways, some of our cultural unhappiness and the emotional soup that we were talking about earlier may not so much be, you know, too much technology or too much social media, but instead be the fact that we work all the time, that we're constantly focused on being these perfect Pinterest selves, uh, and that we've really become separated from our collective, and that chasing happiness is never going to get us there. Uh, and so what we need to do is we need to pay more attention to our collective well-being um, to shore up our social connections and to uh, prioritize that in our lives. Yeah, that makes sense. That's a clear message for all people out there. <laughs> take that and run with it. Yep. One last thing that comes to mind is it now turned into 2020. Do you look at the change in the decade do you like see it as a psychological switch over to the next step? Do you like to use the new year as a springboard or how do you think about it? Mm -hmm. um, personally, I love to use the new year as a new springboard and, you know, I'm a college professor. And one of the things I love about being a college professor is, you know, we get semesters and you wrap everything up with a bow and you start fresh and new. And so cycles of renewal and can see 2020 as this unusual you know, it's just a number, but, you know, if it, if it gets us there, why not? And I did feel, you know, I'm a big person, um, I'm a big person, but as someone who spends a lot of time on Twitter. <laughs> and mm. I did like feel, Twitter. yeah, <laughs> I did feel like when we ticked over to 2020, there was a change in, um, a lot of people seem to be feeling a sense of renewal. And then a, a few, you know, current events happened and that quickly kind of went down. But um, maybe we can get back to it because I think it would be great if we could use 2020 as um, a new starting point, a new relationship to each other in the world and social media. Mm -hmm. Warm nature be between us. That's mm -hmm. true. This is wonderful. Dr. Sarah Rose Cavanaugh, I want to <laughs> thank you for having been on episode 245 of the show. Thank you. You know it. And we are out. <laughs> <laughs>